Hi, everybody. We are back. Are you still with me? Cheers. Coffee. No espresso, which is my kind, but that's what to, what to do. Um, so we're going to kind of radically move the agenda uh, from the previous uh, talk. Uh, and that's what was as moderated. I, I took my power and just tried to veer a little bit because um, the conversation in the previous uh, lecture and it was uh, very uh, focused, which I appropriately so in, you know, again, going to with what Yoshi presented, thick experience, the thick uh, phenomenology. Um, so this, this panel will be about uh, empirical work, which inevitably had to deal with the thin <laughs> phenomenology, uh, because that's all at this point what we could do. Um, and then this is not to put it down or up, is where we are at with uh, the situation. And uh, hopefully I need to be looking to that. And the intention here of the, the panelists, including myself, in this case, I'm one of, one of them, is to try to establish that link that we talked um, uh, earlier today about you know, the, the kind of the humanities and the hard sciences sort of, of human experience and, and uh, qualia and quantitative stuff. So we're going to have uh, four uh, people presented four different projects. And um, uh, as a moderator, I will be the last one to, to present. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jonathan Berger. Uh, Jonathan is the Denning Family Provostial Professor in Music at Stanford University. He's a composer, a researcher uh, of music uh, cognition. Uh, also the recent recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and the Rome Prize. He's, he currently leads a cross-disciplinary study of the interplay of architecture, acoustic, and music. Jonathan, please. So um, while Lorenzo sets me up here, first of all, let me thank Julio and your squad of intrepid uh, people, <laughs> Lorenzo and Amir and all the your students in the back who've done just a superb job. And this has just been um, such an enlightening and wonderful experience. So thank you. Um, so I'm the outsider in the group. I'm a, I'm a musician. I'm not an architect. I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, I dabble. Um, and I want to give uh, sort of contextualize my work here um, and, uh, and start with the concept that um, as much as I love great architecture, I want you to think about an architectural structure as a musical instrument. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean that quite realistically. Um, the, um, um, in, well, to be more precise, it's not a musical instrument as much as a filter. So any sound that's made in, a, in, a, in an architectural space is colored and distorted and stretched and, and munged by, by the, the uh, characteristics of, the, of that space. And so um, Shay Trayan, my colleague in the, on this uh, Temple degree and, and a bunch of my graduate students and myself um, have been looking at this, this, um, this sort of interplay between architectural acoustics and, and music. I'm, I'm really going to get to two factors here. One is that um, that there's there's um, that that acoustics and the music that was built for, to be played in those acoustics are sometimes at odds with each other, and that's something that interests me greatly. Um, but other times they play together or they work together. To, to augment the sense of otherness, right? And um, so let me give a few, a few ideas here. So first of all, um, um, there have been a number of studies on the phenomena, phenomenology of sacred spaces um, that refer to sound and ritual housed in these spaces. Similarly, some research on the phenomenology of sacred music account for the architectural features of the spaces in which that music experience. However, little research has been devoted to the affective causes and effects of the collaboration between architecture and sound. A few scholars have described the multi-sensory nature of some sacred experiences, but few empirical studies have considered how sound and space integrate and collaborate to elicit the sense of spirituality associated with these experiences. So our work really aims to explore this integration. 
Specifically, we're interested in two aspects, as I mentioned. First, the psychological and physiological factors associated with a sense of, with eliciting a sense of awe. And second, the sensation of disorientation. That's the, that's the, um, the anxiety that's caused that seems to result in sometimes in these combinations. I'm gonna state the obvious, but nothing to me is obvious. Architecture is voluminous, stationary, and material. It's comprised of edged geometric com com components. At times, it alters the perception of time, of size. Altered perceptions such as these can trigger and convey deep affective responses. I'm happy to talk about any of these spaces, should you wish. Music is transitory, ephemeral, and intangible. Unlike the edged nature of architectural components, sound lacks edges and thus is prone to blur te the temporal. At times, it alters our perception of, of time. Consider, for example, the opening seconds of this responsory by Thomas de Victoria, a setting that some subjects describe as time-stopping or temporally warping speed. We have to enable music. Music was not enabled. You heard nothing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Right. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take the liberty of starting them again. So that this. It's always difficult to stop music. Um, I, 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 get, I get very upset when someone does that in a lecture, so forgive me. Um, um, so are the intensities of the affective results of perception in one sensory modality modulated or attenuated by that of the other? Could the interaction of architecture and music confuse an individual's estimation of physical size or of temporality? In this case, in the case of this responsory, which was clearly written to be done at a tempo that reflects the, the, reverberance, um, the reverberant nature of the space that it was written for, it, there's, a, there's a harmonious relationship between the rate of speed and, and it's almost as if the reverberation, the acoustics harmonizes itself. That is not always the case. So, um, so um, the question is, when it's not the case, is that perhaps a, uh, is that tension and that anxiety perhaps a factor in eliciting a sense of awe? Our central hypothesis is that compounded perceptual alterations can lead to cross-modal sensory confusion. More specifically, we conjecture that implicit sensory confusion between auditory and visual estimation of size and geometries of architectural space can evoke deeply affective responses. And here I'm gonna play one more example. So you're looking here at, um, at the Duomo in Florence at Santa Maria dei Fiori, um, seen from where the dome is. Um, I need not tell architect architects and architecture students that Brunelleschi finished the dorm, dome in 1436, um, and it was this monumental structure that um, that um, posed a challenge to everybody. I mean, there was there was no understanding of how it could actually stand, and it was seen as this as this um, glorious landmark space to to celebrate the space. The probably the most famous composer in in uh, on the continent, um, a, a composer from the north named uh, Guillaume de Fay was commissioned to write a, uh, a motet to celebrate the consecration of the dome. Of the dome. 
Um, and he wrote this Nuperozorum Floris, which for music students is on, it will be on your first year music history test where, when, whenever you take this, uh, take the class. Um, I, so often we hear this piece, but we never hear it in the acoustics that it was intended for. So what I'm gonna play now is the result of one part of the Templeton project that we did, which is going into these spaces where we know these, the, the sort of the musical events that happen there, taking very careful measurements of the spaces. We do something that's called impulse response recordings. We, 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 um, we measure how the reflectivity of sound and the, the decay time of sound, we measure, um, I'm, look, I'm looking for the right person to say it. We measure the resonant properties of the sound, um, where the, what, what resonates there. And then, um, and then we go and build a computational model of the acoustics of the sound so that we can replicate it. Um, one of the nice outgrowths of that is that we can then record the music in very dry, we call it near anechoic space, and then process the music with the original acoustics. So what you're hearing here is the beginning of Nuperozorum Floris, as it was heard inside the dome in 1436. So uh, here again, I, I stopped it because I know Julio is gonna stop me at exactly 11 minutes. Um, so, um, but one of the interesting things about this music is that um, you notice that unlike um, the Victoria, O Magnus Mysterium, this when heard inside the Duomo, there's sort of a auditory chiaroscuro. The, um, the, the, the notes get sort of blurred into each other and the harmonic rate is such that it gets a little bit dissonant. It, it, um, it's not always clear that um, sort of the beauty of the, of the harmony, the perfection of the harmony that we were talking about before is almost, I mean, it has to be intentionally um, not there, not evident. So, um, so this is sort of what one of the things that we're, we're looking at. So, um, so this is our, one of the hypotheses that we're currently working on is that the compound perceptual alterations can lead to cross-modal confusion and that there, that is a factor in eliciting this sense of, of call it what you will, anxiety or 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 transcendence. Um, our methods. Um, so speaks for itself. Our methods. So we have um, really five and a half stages of of method, methods. One is um, the most fun, which is we do this this deep humanities dive into the musical life. Um, first of all, we have to find spaces that are musically important, that have, I mean, which is subjective. Um, and then we have to find, then we have to ascertain that the architecture has not radically changed since it was built. That's tricky because with every pope comes new sculptures and new changes, and with every sculpture comes different reflections. And so, um, so it's, 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 um, it's not an easy task. The Duomo, which we did choose, has in fact undergone certain changes, but we can actually um, try to account for them by manipulating the, uh, the acoustical work for that. Anyway, we do this archival research where we look at the music and we, 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 um, we look at the spaces. Then we do these site visits where we, um, we get permission to actually go into these fantastically beautiful and wonderful and culturally significant places and pop balloons galore, which is how we measure the, um, the, reverberation, the reverberation time. And we do a bunch of other things. Um, then we go and do the computational work. We analyze and model it. Then um, working our way down, which is where we are right now with some of these, we do, um, we, we recreate the acoustics um, and we, can, we have a method that, um, that we recently patented, which is um, allows you to recreate very, um, pretty precisely the acoustics of any measured space in any room, as long as that room doesn't have its own weird acoustic properties. So it has to be a, a reasonably dry studio. So we then create these spaces where you where one walks into the space and they are literally 
sort of in the Duomo, even though they're in a small studio. So that, um, of course, magnifies the, 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 the disorientation here. And that's something that we're working on. So now we're incorporating virtual reality into this. Um, and we're doing a number of types of human subject studies. One involves performers. How does a performer come into a space and how do they adapt to the particular acoustics of a space? This beyond the sacred architecture piece of this conference is a hugely interesting problem for a musician. A, a, a pianist, do I have two more minutes? A pianist walks into, I'm being very careful. A pianist walks into a, a, a hall that she has never played in before. This is not atypical. And she has a half an hour to try the piano out and then play a concert. And then, you know, a great pianist plays six of these concerts over two weeks in six different places with six different pianos in six different halls with entirely different acoustics. And so she walks into the hall and typically what she does is she'll, first of all, she'll spend 10 minutes getting the seat to feel right. That's the most important part. But then, um, then she'll just either play one note or just a little diddle, you know, something non-musical at all. And she doesn't even know that she's listening to the space, but that's how she adapts to the space. And we have evidence of across centuries of musicians consciously or subconsciously sort of reacting to spaces this way. But nobody has really ever studied that phenomenon of how someone comes and adapts to an, an, an architectural uh, uh, acoustic space so quickly and so agilely. So that's one thing we're studying. The other thing we're studying is, um, is indeed the, uh, the reactions of people hearing sacred music in, in and out of the context of these sacred spaces. So um, we're now doing these behavioral experiments um, I'm very excited to be here because our we've we've we we've created virtual reality reality um, settings so now one can sort of walk through these spaces um, and hear and hear as they walk through the space they they hear um, distance change and uh, acoustics change. Um, what we haven't done is the neuroscience part of this, so we're trying to integrate that with uh, with um, EEG using um, what's what's called uh, intersubject correlation, where rather than the sort of the typical EEG um, systems where you're looking at sort of the averaging the voltage response in individual listeners, typically in, in, um, in musical snippets that are completely out of context, this way we could actually play entire pieces of music and hear and sort of judge how, how people engage with those, those spaces. Um, so, um, I was asked to ask to talk about the challenges, and I'm, I, I'm, I have another spot tomorrow where I'll actually talk about the difficulties and challenges in the research. So I'll just say that for for on on um, on a technical level, I'll I'll speak to that tomorrow. Um, on the on the level of what we're really interested in, um, this is a, a you know my approach to this, being an aging almost dead white guy um, in a European culture with the upbringing of, you know, this is the music I, I know and love, um, but how, do, how does that speak to other cultures, right? So we're, we're trying to look at this cross-culturally. Um, I've got a group of students who, who um, in, insist that they're gonna drag me there to, um, uh, with them to go to Fishmouth Cave in Utah and, and test the, the acoustics of these caves that have sort of ritual properties. We, know, we, we don't know the rituals themselves, but we know that they were um, sonically, ritually important. Um, we were working with an archeologist, Shay is, is working um, very closely with an, with an Egyptologist on a funerary site in Saqqara. And of course, um, the really interesting thing in archeology span is that these sites get covered up. So, so we first have to actually recreate the space and then we have to recreate the acoustics of the space. And then we have to infer what kind of sounds might have gone into these spaces and, and how they might have sounded from the inside and from the outside. And, and so this is a totally exciting um, new venture that I didn't expect. Um, and it's apparently um, tweaked the interest of, of uh, archeologists because we're giving a, um, a talk in the International Conference of Egyptology here soon, um, which 
I never expect to do that. Um, we're working with archaeologists in in um, in Inca ruins in Peru, um, and um, and so we're we're looking beyond the Eurocentricity of which I bring to the table. Um, the last thing that um, that <laughs> so the quick word is we disseminate. We everything we do is publicly available. Thank you. Zach, uh, please come to the podium. Hey, Barat. Um, he's uh, currently a postdoc at Alborg University, focusing on the role of architecture affordances in cognition and behavior by use of mobile EEG, uh, VR, and computational neuroscience. Zach is an interdisciplinary researcher and is currently investigating how unconscious sensory motor brain dynamics modulate behavior and cognition. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it should be working, right? Yeah, it seems to. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. I want to take the uh, a moment just to say thank you to Julio and the team for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak about uh, the neuroscience of the unconscious in architecture. I will, uh, in particular, take a point of departure in what I, what is called trans telemic integration. I will hopefully uh, and successfully explain what that means. <clears throat> so I will basically talk a bit about the adaptive unconscious. And in relation to that, uh, I want to suggest that architecture affects us constantly and unconsciously. I will also speak a bit about the fact that the body is an active and processful organism. And I will do that in light of uh, cognitive science, basically suggesting that uh, mobile neuroscience is unique in discovering unconscious and rhythmic processes, sort of speaking to the ecological validity that we spoke about yesterday. And then I will finally uh, explain a bit uh, or talk a bit about uh, understanding human skills uh, through transthalamic integration. And I will do that by pointing at the importance of the thalamus in the brain body environment triad. So at first, I would have to invoke the uh, the concept of the adaptive unconscious, which is basically where two uh, separate uh, concepts put together, um, and has been quite nicely defined, I think, by Timothy Wilson in Strangers to Ourselves, uh, which you can find here. It's a fantastic read. I really recommend it. Where he says that, uh, well, the adaptive unconscious sort of uh, speaks to the mental processes that are inaccessible to consciousness, but has an impact on decisions, feelings, and behavior. So it should be clear here that I'm not talking about any kind of Freudian sense of the unconscious. I'm uh, speaking more about the awareness of the processes. So in that case, well, we can have some that are implicit and some that are explicit. Um, well, the implicit ones usually refer to the salient, the spontaneous, the automatic. Usually those are very hard to come uh, to access versus those that are explicit, um, those that are directed, planned, manual, and conscious. So here I'll just invoke another. Um, so this is an experiment, very famous experiment by Simmons and Lewin that I just briefly want to mention, uh, showing that, yes, we do fail to detect changes to people during a real world interaction, because when we're given a task, we're basically focusing on the task. So all attention is basically on the task, um, which, comes at the cost of basically adapting to the environment. And so you don't necessarily become aware of the environment in solving a task. And this raises an important question, I think, of uh, in terms of the phenomenology of the unconscious, um, basically suggesting that, um, well, since attention is the active suppression of noise, and well, let's be fair, I know we're all architects, or most of us are architects around here. Well, architecture is not the center of attention of everyone. For most people, it's not. Uh, it's basically the noise that happens in the background and you're usually doing something else. Uh, so architecture sort of becomes the noise that you're trying to cancel out as you're performing some, uh, some action or some, some task. But then as an architect, I like to think that maybe this noise, we should consider it as being phenomenologically rich. And this is basically what I will uh, sort of introduce in a second. So this is basically a bunch of experiments that I, that I tried to sum up in a, in a uh, publication where I show that, well, if you change the visual dynamics of the periphery, you 
basically change people's behavior without them noticing. So there is no awareness of this change. What's quite interesting about this is that this is not only a phenomenon that applies to human beings, it also applies to, uh, to birds and to uh, some insects, especially honeybees. So if you change the peripheral dynamics of the honeybee or the human being, you're also changing their, uh, their behavior. And I find that fascinating, especially if you increase the cognitive load. So if the task becomes more difficult, they rely even more on their peripheral uh, vision. And so uh, this really speaks to, uh, yeah, I should mention this. Uh, I'm not going to exhaust all the examples, but I did publish a paper uh, last year about a bunch of examples and trying to explain the uh, neural dynamics of, of this particular uh, uh, phenomenon. So what's interesting about this phenomenon is, uh, in particular, the fact that uh, we have to sort of acknowledge that we need to move beyond the passive approach to, to, to cognition, sort of saying that, well, the way that I perceive the world is that, well, I have a perception of the world, and then some cognitive uh, black box sort of happens, and then I act, uh, I select actively, deliberately an action. Um, because I think that these examples of showing how you're not necessarily always aware of what makes you do something or make a specific decision, especially in terms of behavior, uh, actually can come itself from the action. So as people are moving, the environment is changing, and so they are being uh, enacted by the environment. This, this, quite, uh, this turns things around, in my opinion, uh, stating that, well, you can actually learn something about perception from the action. Oh, oh, I should have, yeah, it's not really readable here. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, but the perfect concept for understanding that relationship between the action and perception would be the, the, the concept of affordances, which re basically refers to the possibilities of action depending on the kind of body you have and the kind of environment that you are in. So if this is really true, um, then I set out a few years ago to sort of uh, ask the question, well, uh, first of all, why is the brain of any interest in this case? Well, because the sensory dynamics are measurable in the brain. So if you understand the affordances as being kind of embodied predictions, well, then you can ask the question, can space alter embodied prediction? And we basically hypothesize that, yes, well, we should be able to measure systematic changes over the sensory motor cortex as a function of affordances in parallel with perception. I'll just briefly go through um, uh, some of the, the studies that I, that I did. Basically here, we ask people to go from one space into another one. We combine virtual reality with mobile EEG to basically to test, well, does action and perception processes happen uh, in sequence or do they occur in parallel? Uh, and if they per uh, occur in, uh, well, either sequences or parallel, uh, what pattern do they follow? And we basically show here that um, the early responses, so basically um, the perceptual proce processes and the action-related processes occur already 60 milliseconds after perceiving the space, and they occur totally in parallel, uh, which is quite interesting for, in, for, for, for many reasons, uh, even beyond architecture. We also looked at what happens during the process in which that you are asked to actually approach a door and basically pass it. Uh, so this is more of a continuous approach into the to the affordances, and we, again we identify some of the perceptual processes, uh, perceptual areas, uh, and motor areas to be of highly highly uh, relevance, and we find a, a very um, continuous and strong uh, suppression of the uh, alpha brainwave. Um, well, in both cases here. So basically, from these two these two studies, we learned that well, the whole question of how can I act it is is actually a part of what do I perceive because of the signal, uh, signal sensory signals and the affordances are being resolved in parallel. We also learned that the brain is continuously affected by the affordances, and this I think is a very important uh, sub conclusion here that it's a continuous experience of the world that sort of your presence depends on the past and it goes on like this sort of unfolding uh, continuously. So this brings me to the next point here, which is about the trans integration. And basically the thalamus is a X-shaped uh, piece of, of uh, well, I could say organ within the brain subcortically, um, in which all our sensory and motor information emerges up into the neocortex. So there's absolutely no sensory information that does not pass the thalamus. All this information about the world has to pass the thalamus. It's a gate for the brain to understand the world all except for the olfactory that has a different uh, pathway. But the rest, you name it, sensory, uh, that's touch, heat, uh, and so on, vision, all pass through the thalamus. 
So the conservative view of the thalamus is basically that it's a um, unidirectional relay, uh, relay station for sensory motor flow. So basically all of your information is like passing through and it's just in one direction. Uh, and that allows it to function as a passive filter mechanism that makes it completely irrelevant to all cognitive uh, skills because we like to believe that cognitive skills reside in the neocortex, so it cannot pass it back down. Well, the emerging views sort of suggest that actually there's uh, pretty good evidence that the major brain regions are projecting back to the thalamus, and so the thalamus becomes an integrative hub with bidirectional information flow, actively connecting the major brain regions and therefore also very central to our cognitive skills. And in that paper that I mentioned before, we come up with this, uh, well, at the level of the, uh, of the of neural populations, trying to explain, well, how does the, the mechanism look like and what can we learn from that? And well, if this is really true, then if cognition and behavior are unconsciously affected by the thalamus, and we also accept that the thalamus is uh, affected by the flow of sensory information, um, and the continuous flow of sensory information, uh, the, the continuous flow of uh, sensory information is designed by affordances. Well, then that could mean that architects uh, uh, can generally, and I mean that quite literally, generally affect behavior and unconscious processes. And I think this is the main point that I want to convey. So, in an attempt to understand how we can change sensory motor uh, information flow, we work with uh, transitions because transitions, uh, depending on how much you turn, you can actually change the visual dynamics. As you turn 90 degrees, uh, imagine yourself in Manhattan, New York. Well, every turn is a completely new world for you. But if you roam around in any, uh, well, most European cities that basically grew very organically and naturally, you'll find a lot of, well, soft corners, you could say. Um, and the advantage of them, well, or the difference, not necessarily an advantage, but the difference is that the sensory information comes at you very slowly. So we did some simulations and to show that this is really the case, the velocity of sensory information. And we came up with a design uh, of an experimental design in which you have to direct your attention to a specific, a specific task, right? So the task thing is already like, check. You're asked to direct your attention to solve very, something very specific. Now the environment around your, like the virtual periphery is const continuously changing. And uh, I didn't bring any uh, results, uh, but I guarantee you there are some strong and robust uh, effects. Um, but I would um, speak a bit about um, some of the areas that we find to be active. So, oh, I also mentioned that this experiment was, uh, is, uh, was done uh, with uh, mobile EEG, uh, eye tracking and uh, virtual reality all synchronized into a single uh, file. I will speak about uh, some of the methodological uh, challenges and advantages in doing that tomorrow. So, um, so, uh, some neuroscientists that are sitting here today, well, they go, mm, Zach, you probably cannot measure thalamic activity from an EEG. Yes, you're absolutely right, we cannot. But what we can do is raise it, we can create a computational model and we can create uh, statistical, uh, st uh, statistical inferences in which we can infer to what, to what uh, degree and to what extent did the thalamus contribute to the measured activity. And in that case, we would have to use a very specific algorithm that is called dynamic causal modeling for EEG, and um, basically here you can see some of the structures that we identify and the model that, we're, that we build uh, and trying to understand the relationship between the major brain regions and the role of the thalamus in this case. So I just gave you some examples of how the unconscious can impact sensory more dynamics and architectural uh, design. And if you're interested, I recommend you to read the, the, the publication we made last year. We have more than eight different studies showing how uh, if you change the environment, you, you change people's cogni uh, cognitive performance and their behavior. I also showed you that we, if we consider the body as uh, active and processable, well, then you have the opportunity of using mobile neuroscience to uncover some of the rhythmic processes that you un uh, otherwise could not. Um, and also showed you here briefly at the end that the thalamus it becomes quite an important, uh, well, it's a region of the brain because uh, it sort of ties the brain, the body, and the environment all together. Um, not to say that the thalamus itself is interesting, it's the role of the thalamus and the network in which it is present that is interesting. So some open questions here about the contemplative experience that I think are worth uh, sort of raising um, is that, it, well, it, so people that do these experiments are not really aware of the dynamic changes. They just do the task and they walk. But we see them change their behavior. And the question is, can you have a phenomenology of that you are not conscious? Is conscious always the only thing you can be 
like they, they, like they can exist a phenomenology of. Um, I tend to not think that is the case. I do think that you can have um, a phenomenology of the unconscious. I just don't think that it's necessarily accessible. And it's, if, if at all, uh, it must be very, very difficult. But if we all agree that maybe, well, you can have um, uh, uh, unconscious uh, phenological experiences, are they then kind, the kinds of, of experiences, are they stronger or are they weaker? I think that this is an important question because if you go into a church and you have a fantastic experience that you cannot put into word, I think also today it was very clear from Michael's uh, example that it's difficult to put into words exactly what an experience is like. Uh, without at least cutting off uh, well more than half of the experience, well, these experiences are not necessarily we're not conscious of them in the same sense. But do they mean? But, but does that mean that they are less real in the phenological sense? I, I do not think so. But I'm just going to raise this question here. So if someone wants to discuss this, I would be very happy. Um, some of the methodological challenges I will speak about them tomorrow. Uh, one last sentence for me. I think after these experiments, I uh, think that we as architects has been completely cheated. Uh, completely uh, robbed in many ways because we spent five years, maybe more, to study space when actually we realized that, well, the uh, the experience of space has much more to do with, with uh, time and expectations than, than space alone. So thank you for your active attention. Yep. You talk about time. Over you, you, time? You, you, no, you talk about time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were not mixed up. <laughs> it's a long conversation. Um, Matthew Nierman uh, is going to be next. Uh, um, Reverend uh, Dr. Matthew Nierman, he's amazing. He's a doctor in architecture and also pastor. That's an amazing uh, combination. Uh, he's associate. This is the same work. Microphone is dead. Hello. <laughs> All right. Um, Matthew is Associate Dean of Architecture at California Baptist University. His research focuses on empirical investigations of formal and symbolic aesthetics of sacred architecture, exploring the intersections of built form, aesthetic perception, and correlated perception of place held by religious and non religious individuals. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to all the fellow panelists and the intriguing thoughts that grant a lot of conversations over dinner. This is fantastic. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee brought uh, some interesting concluding thoughts to his presentation yesterday, where he gave us a series of uh, ideas that we need to keep in front of our mind as we move forward. And one of those ideas is the danger, or perhaps the caution in designing for a population that we don't know much about. Much of my work and some of, and, and one of my lines of inquiry in my research studies a very contemporary case of just this. Uh, it, I study the American Protestant Evangelical Church who has spent better part of the last 40 years dedicating their thought and their funds to designing a church for the unchurched. Uh, prior to getting into this a little bit more, I want to frame this a little bit with some ecclesiological priorities, putting on my theological hat, and then also some historical uh, kind of framing before we get into what this actually is and the experiment that follows. So I want to offer a series of, of charts and graphs here. I apologize to any theologian in the room. This is a straw man. This is, this is not really fully nuanced, but this goes to serve the point, perhaps, of the presentation and perhaps illustrate uh, Dr. Graham's uh, kind of illumination of the Protestant differences uh, just previously. So in the Catholic Church, obviously, there's a, a little bit more of a priority in, in the ecclesiology or the purpose of the church. Uh, at least in the Protestant sense, the ecclesiology often speaks to the purposes of the church, which is known as threefold in the Protestant church, worship, edifying the community, and evangelism and service. Uh, we see within the Catholic church is often much more of a priority on worship, although Catholics may not kind of call it that way. Uh, and then the flip to the Protestant church had a higher priority on edification of the community, the body of believers being the church itself. But primarily, I want to focus on the point being made here in the third diagram. Within the Protestant evangelical church, the main emphasis is on evangelism um, and service. So that becomes a priority, and that becomes the main point in how and why to design the church, and hence the impetus to design for the unchurched in that setting. 
Now, this, this idea of designing a church for the unchurched is a fascinating topic uh, that's been around for quite a while, but has had a particular point in the last 40 years. This really derives off of missiological theories or theories of missions and how to reach folks uh, with the gospel. And this began with a gentleman uh, named Donald McGavran, who was not uh, studying the American context at all. He studied a lot of the, the missions efforts across overseas, beginning to develop theories on what works and what didn't work. Why would we send missionaries to a particular place and a church would establish and, and, and would be flourishing and we would send people to other places and a hospital and school would establish, but no church would be formed. So why did this happen? And he had a lot of different theories that were quite popular, but one particular theory with, during his time at Fuller Theological Seminary came known as this homogeneous unit principle. Now the homogeneous unit principle begins to say that people don't like to cross boundaries. They don't like to cross cultural boundaries or things they're uncomfortable with. And so there was a massive extrapolation of this general idea of the homogeneous unit principle in the sense that they, once the, the theory got popularized in the missions field, several American pastors and American missiologists said, how can we begin to apply this to the American setting? To Dr. Gad McGavran's uh, credit, he often resisted this for many, many years until it finally became applied to the American setting. Well, American evangelicals, again, are not necessarily fascinated by worship or liturgy, but they're really fascinated by how do we reach our neighbors and how do we reach other people? So in that, the motivation does not come through the theology or the liturgy, but it often comes through sociological studies to understand who my neighbor is so I can reach them better. Uh, and in this case, the homogeneous unit principle began to get applied to studies of who is my neighbor. Now, right up here, we see uh, there's a lot of different versions of this, but this is Saddleback Sam. Uh, churches began to establish personas of who are the people we're trying to reach and how do we understand them and who they are and what they are so we can begin to uh, create not only ministries for them, but spaces for them. Now, this was an interesting turn in the whole uh, role of architecture and missions in the evangelical church. Uh, for a long time, it would be, let's send people out from the church to go and to witness. Uh, but this became a fundamental turn, which said, how can we then bring people to us? How can we attract people to us instead of going out and we're going to do this through this homogeneous principle? Now, the application of understanding who, in this case, Saddleback Sam, Saddleback is the name of church, Sam is just a general persona there. Uh, how do we understand Saddleback Sam? How do we understand that people don't like to cross cultural boundaries? Let's put this together. Let's assume a lot of things about the unchurched and let's, let's kind of make a church for them. Well, in this case, this is what comes out of this, what's known as architectural evangelism. So architectural evangelism has several different points, and all of you are familiar with this. Uh, think Walmart, think church, put them together on every street corner, right? And this has been one of the most fundamental kind of radical reinventions of church all over America uh, that everybody has seen, right? This is, this is the, the theory behind it all. So in architectural evangelism, in order to reach the unchurched, we have to have a barrier-free church experience. So then we begin to say, well, what actually are the barriers to people coming to church? Well, if we think about Saddleback Sam, uh, these are all those direct quotes from the training seminars that were held 23 or two years ago. Uh, this person would go to the IBM headquarters uh, on Monday through Friday. So we should make our church seem just like the IBM headquarters. So there's no dissonance traveling between Monday and Friday and Sunday. So we begin to explore the idea of let's, using, let's use secular typologies. Let's begin to use things free from religious symbolism because that'll cause a barrier. I'm not quite sure what that cross means or what that uh, you know, Lutheran church banner means. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and remove all of those. We should also um, take worship so it's very familiar, but we should also emphasize community functions, which was inherent in the Protestant church anyway. But how do we make this much more about the community and the family? Uh, and we need to do this in a very uh, uh, simple, austere way, so we don't be seen presumptuous in beauty or spending, seem like we're spending more money on ourselves and the community itself. Well, I spent many years studying this phenomena uh, in understanding that we really haven't talked to the unchurched about this at all. This became kind of a crafted theory, uh, the, warning of, the warning that we've been given. Uh, a lot of my dissertation, a lot of work beyond this began to eventually find actually this theory was quite wrong. Uh, we need to speak to the unchurch, heed the warning, Dr. Chetergy, and speak to the church to understand what this is. So I want to share a study with you that has actually followed a lot of studies on this, a most recent, of a recent study, uh, that began to ask a, a very dangerous question. So I asked a lot of personal identity construct questions with the unchurched and found nearly every point of this was wrong. So I really began to understand the unchurched. But I, I dared to ask the question, 
do buildings actually matter? Now, I can understand how they might be affecting things, but are they actually affecting how people understand the church or begin to understand the faith? So I ran a, a, a small experiment, so 200 participants, uh, really just beginning to poke at this idea, wondering, uh, maybe to Zach's kind of loose association here, if I change the peripheral vision of somebody, does that begin to change their understanding of the church? What is the presence of an architectural evangelism church, a church that doesn't look like a church in society versus a church that does look like it versus just a secular typology there? Does that make any effect on people's understanding or desire for church? So in this, we began to look at uh, heuristics or decision-making processes, you know, quick shortcuts. We don't know the answer. We have these heuristics that get us to those answers. And often these lead us to false answers, but we have to acknowledge that they're there and they, they, they're that mental crutch that gets us to the answer. So I looked at availability heuristic and a priming effect, asking, does a church, uh, can a church, will a church act as a priming effect or availability heuristic for people's decisions? This is the basic premise behind this study. Uh, so we began to uh, take 200 participants, uh, 190 of those surveys qualified, uh, across a fully cross set between gender, uh, age, the whole spectrum, geography across the U.S., and then church to non-church participations. And what we did is we uh, brought them into an environment. We showed them a video uh, driving down a street, not telling them why they were watching this video, uh, and, and just begin to prime them or give them availability heuristics. So they either drove across and a, a, a pure prototypical church would come across, or we would drive them past a non-church, or we drive them past a non-ecclesial church or architectural evangelism type church. And, you know, they watched the video, and then they were provided with a digital survey that began to ask questions that they really wouldn't know the answer to, making them rely on the, the heuristic to kind of answer these questions. Again, we're trying to see, does that affect or that church change how they understood uh, what percentage of Christians and or percentage of Americans identify as Christian, or what percentage of Americans attend church? How active and lively is the church? What percentage of Americans do you think attends church every week? And is the church attendance increasing or decreasing? Right. So what is the, what is the basic status of the church? Uh, just looking at these videos. Uh, interestingly, and, and, and pretty consistently across um, our work here, the, there is no real statistical significance in gender, age, or geography. This is actually the first study we've had where uh, church participation was not statistically significant. Uh, but what was statistically significant was what video they, are, they were actually experienced or what, what kind of church they were driving past. So I'll just show you real quick the results here. Uh, when asked what percentage of America or adults in America self-identify as Christian, ecclesial structure, people who were uh, exposed to that says 60%, commercial 52%, and non-ecclesial structures or architectural evangelism 54%. What percentage of Americans attended church once per month on average? You can see here, again, that same pattern follows. 44% when they just drove by, and, drove by and didn't even really notice the ecclesial church. Commercial structures, 34. And non-ecclesial church structures, 38. What percentage of Americans do you think attend church weekly on average? Uh, 30, not only the answers in themselves are interesting, but the comparatives are also interesting as well. Uh, 31%. Commercial structures, 26. Non-ecclesial structures, 30. And in the American church, is attendance increasing or decreasing since 2010, and by what percentage? Okay. Now, they're all in the negative, which is interesting to observe, uh, but to what extent is the more interesting part here. Ecclesial church structures are declining by 3.2. Exposed to commercial structures decline by 8.4 and exposed to non-ecclesial structures or architectural evangelism declining by negative 4.2. So there's clearly a difference in their priming effect or their availability heuristic in showing how that began to uh, affect their understanding of the church itself. So I often speak at, at Protestant evangelical settings, and the first response I get is, yes, but I know a church that's thriving under a tree. Uh, this is the classic Protestant response. We don't need buildings, uh, which I say, great, continue to meet under a tree. But I would like to argue that not every church should meet under a tree, right? Because if we begin to remove that externalization of the faith from our culture, uh, the availability heuristics or even the priming heuristics or that sacred canopy to can bring Jonathan Berger into the picture here, uh, isn't there. And it makes it more difficult to believe uh, that the church is thriving or that they might actually attend to that. 
Now, this is a, a, an immense, what we might call a cottage industry for the evangelical Protestants. There are, there are two monthly publications on this, magazines that come out, which is an annual conference, and there's annual design awards, the Solomon Awards for this. Uh, so this is an enormous portion here, and, it, and, and a part of the evangelical church which is not necessarily willing to move or move slowly uh, away from this. But I think this is the value of what we're doing here, not only in the sense of uh, providing observations, but providing deeper thoughts about who our people are and what the intent is, even if we're snake handling or we're worshiping in a cathedral or in, in my tradition, the Evangelical Protestant Church, attempting to reach our neighbors uh, to attend church at that point as well. So thank you very much. I look forward to talking with the other panelists. Fantastic. <laughs> And this, there is me. <laughs> so can we come? Uh, maybe we should wait until you see what I have to show. Then you, you run the conference because probably you're not that good at anything else. So you must run the conference. Um, yeah. Thank you. So this is a big team. So I'm the, the speaking head here. Uh, we have, uh, well, you see Amir and Juliana, uh, Matthew and Nick, and of course, my, 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 my colleague, uh, uh, Yoshi Nakamura, we met, uh, but uh, you're gonna meet tomorrow, um, Lin Chin Chang, uh, the professor in computer science and so on. So, um, so since, since prehistory, sacred structures have worked as pedagogical, devices to advance spiritual information and as environments to facilitate the experience of spiritual reality. Without uh, exaggeration, there may be no faster or easier way to access a spiritual state or reality than entering a sacred space. So what if uh, accessing a spiritual reality and understanding is as simple and direct as entering Domus Dei or the house of God to cite Christian scriptures, although this principle applies to all religions, just by opening a door. This is of course a huge if, but it's hardly easy for most of us to access spiritual states in our ordinary life as anybody has tried to pray or meditate or do anything uh, but spiritual uh, attest. Notice that are, we're looking two things. We are looking, on one sense, the effect of buildings or sacred structure on ourselves, not of architecture itself, but the effect. And then we also looking at or assume, and most of architects we need to do that, otherwise our life will not have meaning. That architecture has an, a powerful um, impact. We nudge people, whether consciousness or unconsciousness, um, we have that conversation, probably unconsciously, into some sort of a state. Now, uh, theological aesthetics and other fields, uh, scholarship uh, for a long time, but uh, also more recently, have been looking and providing uh, reasons uh, uh, about why this could happen. Uh, we have heard some ar argumentations for that, some art articulations uh, today about that. Uh, Richard was talking about this and, and so on. Um, but uh, in reality, they provide very little or no empirical evidence. And here we are. So the idea of having this conference is perhaps we could advance, uh, humbly saying so, um, the field of uh, theological aesthetic, and that's why the second part of the title of this conference is towards an experimental theological aesthetics, acknowledging all the limitations that such a move could have, um, again, inspired by Francisco Varela. So now when I talk about the, the, the Template and Religion Trust um, projects, two projects that uh, we have received funding, and I'm gonna go through it, uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, not right now, but uh, to, to, to show the, the technology there. Uh, so we picked two uh, very emblematic places in Washington, D.C. One is uh, uh, very close, I invited to visit the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, that's the largest Catholic church in the United States. Um, and the second one is the train station, Union Station, 
that also is a very powerful just across the capital, the arrival to the to the capital um, station. Both of them are very uh, emblematic and urban presence. And then we um, pick uh, 30, 32 different um, uh, individuals that are all very strong Catholic faith and uh, randomly assigned to one or the other building to start the experiment with and collected uh, different data. And again, inform the study of neurophenomenology. And the first project, which is you see there, um, collected information through um, e mobile EEG, we'll show in a second, and also a wristband, biometric information about the state of the physiological, physiological individual. At the same time, collected phenomenological data, basically um, um, self-reporting uh, questionnaire as they went through the building and also exit questionnaires. The second project, which that first project is finished and uh, the data is mostly analyzed and shows some, some, uh, some results. The second project we are in the way now doing, we are using uh, mobile eye tracking and also use uh, physiological data measurement just to have a correlation between the two. And of course, back to phenomenological data uh, at the same time. So the two buildings are very powerful. They have about the same scale and presence in the city, at least accessible to ordinary public. Um, accessing them was very important, of course, to those kind of research. Um, and both are used a, a language that is not modern. It's a, it's a historical language, was a neo-Byzantine and the other was more neoclassical um, study. So we want to make sure that there was some sort of correlation of that. As all ecological study, um, they have a lot of issues, you know, uh, that we had to address. Uh, in terms of the population, uh, we, uh, ask uh, people that were uh, strongly Catholic, I'll explain in a second how you measure that, between 21 and 65 years old, they had to have a college degree, uh, have some level of building familiarity, um, having COVID-19 <laughs> vaccinated, and we offer a compensation. Again, I don't have time to explain all why all that, but uh, I would like to say something about the, the strength of belief. Um, we were interested in, in see how a sacred structure affected people of that particular faith. And of course, we had a Catholic university just recruiting people and so on is a lot easier and amazing example. We pick Catholics. And the question, of course, who tells who is a good Catholic for a bad Catholic? So, um, the, and also the amount of time. So this is a good uh, questionnaire. It's, uh, it's like a psychometric proven through many different tests through the age since the, the 80s. So these 10 questions, you go from uh, strongly agree to strongly uh, this strongly agree to strongly agree. Anybody that um, had a ranking uh, over thirty was accepted into into the study. Now let me show if you if we could show these are the the technology we use. This is the CGX Quick Twenty by Cognionic. Um, you could see um, if you could get closer, so you could see it it's, because it's all dark. It's kind of a, almost an ex exoskeleton. Uh, yeah, we had to show it. It's very easy to put, it's about half a pound. Um, so it's, you know, you don't almost feel it. And you have 20 sensors that uh, measure different aspects, uh, parts of the brain, as you could see here. Um, and that was was going on. Uh, I will show you in a second how it worked. Um, the second one is the um, BP-19, which we are using right now. Um, it's a uh, eye tracking uh, system. Uh, you can see examples that I borrowed from my colleague and Sussman, who actually is, I didn't introduce you, you're part of our team, as Tom, uh, I'm basically I'm taking everybody in the PRT. And soon enough, I'm gonna invite you as well and Robin. Um, so I, I hope that you're okay that I borrow your, your slide uh, and, um, and introduce us to iMotion, who is a, a, an amazing company. Uh, we're using this particular technology to, to do the work. And basically, we're going to follow more or less what Anne showed um, today, this morning. And last but not least, uh, we're using Empathica, who is there. It's a basically a, a wristband. It's a, like a watch and that you wear. And that measures you know, heart rate, heart rate variability, um, temperature, uh, conductivity, uh, electric conductivity of the skin, which, of course, is associated with emotion and so on. Uh, we established a very clear uh, path and the, the, the subject had to start and there are five stops. At each stop, uh, the individual had to stop uh, and stay still, particularly for the EEG because it creates a lot of noise for about three minutes. For the uh, other one, it's only just a minute. Um, the, the, uh, we're asking these five questions um, dealing with, you know, from anxiety to sense of spiritual reality. 
They're slightly different for the two studies, um, but there are three that are common to both. And this study um, lasts, in one case, about 35, 40 minutes with the EEG because a little bit longer, where the other one lasts only maybe 20 minutes. Here you have an example of how uh, what this looked like. Uh, in the case of the uh, EEG, uh, we had to walk, and this is actually Madison, who is also part of our team, is back there, walking. Um, and we had to walk behind uh, about uh, no more than 20 feet uh, in which they are, you know, sort of Bluetooth talking uh, with a computer and downloading the data as, as, as it works. Um, and then on the right side is the um, BP uh, eye, um, eye tracking. So it's, it's pretty labor intensive to do this, as you can imagine. Um, we all had to have three people, we had to find days that don't rain, um, make sure that it's the right day for them. I mean, it takes a lot of time uh, to do this. Uh, and then at the end uh, of uh, at the end of, of, of the each block, in our know, when they finish the experience of the basilica or the union station, we have an exit questionnaire uh, in which we have a, a much longer uh, set of questions. Going back to, I think Michael was referring to the post. Um, experiment when they're no more naive. And now uh, the data uh, was huge, huge. I mean, this is, uh, we're talking uh, 60, 500 hertz. Uh, so imagine how much data is producing 20 sensors. Um, also the difference between the two, you know, the, the, um, the physiological data is only about seven, eight uh, a, a second. The other one is 500, 600, 400. So you had to normalize it. Um, I forgot to mention another person in the team, Edward um, Trudeau. He, he was uh, the guru about doing all this normalization and all this incredible uh, work. Noise control was much more uh, damaging than we thought and we were told um, to do. But uh, anyway, so there was a lot of work with the data. It was incredibly taxing on the team to do this. Um, and so we did two types of analysis, one using machine learning, and we're going to hear more about this tomorrow with uh, Dr. Chang presents this. Um, and then we did uh, also requested yet another member of the team here, Zach, uh, he just presented today. He, uh, we asked him to do the microstate analysis uh, of the data. Since uh, the machine learning only delivers so much uh, results, we felt we needed to do a more, um, a different kind of analysis. For the machine learning, we use Python as a, as a software and then random uh, forest uh, classifier. Um, this is what um, it looks like, um, trying to find uh, statistically relevant accuracy, sensitivity, and so on, as you see there, using every second, one second segment as one tree, if you wish. And then you just um, uh, work through, I don't know, 300, three, three, whatever numbers, you calculate times the whole, um, each of the stops. And basically, you have false positive, uh, positive, positive, negative, and so on. What we found uh, in this case is that the gamma band was the, the one most used by AI to uh, determine the difference between the two conditions uh, with uh, very significantly, uh, almost 60% of the time, where you know, um, beta and delta were um, way secondary. Intriguing enough, alpha and theta um, were not very much used. Uh, beta is the, the traditional way in which you operate daily in our in our daily consciousness. Uh, delta is more like meditative states, more um, subconscious. Gamma, some people call the superconscious, high level of attention. Uh, now, in terms of phenomenological results, uh, we found what we expected. Uh, also, in this statistically significant, this is what people responded, statistically significant uh, differences between the sacred space and the secular space. The sacred space produced much less anxiety. It was considered more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it provided more connection to God and other people and uh, themselves. It, it delivered less everyday thinking, which we'll, we'll see in a second through SAC analysis that that what we found as well. And suddenly, for sure, very, very much high level of spiritual reality among Catholic, which is what you expect. So there's nothing new there. Uh, in the macro state analysis, um, uh, uh, we found uh, that 
Um, there are six microstate analyses, and we conducted two analyses of each of the two conditions. And uh, what we found is that the default mode network um, microstate was the one um, that uh, was an average much uh, much more active for longer in in the in the basilica than in the uh, in the um, unit station than the basilica. And that's really important because, of course, the default, the default mode network is associated with um, daydreaming and no high level of attention uh, and, and non-contemplative states. Uh, also, uh, we conducted studies, uh, the parietal cortex channels, and there we found that, um, well, you, you can read it there, that there was clearly differences um, in all these bands. And the parietal uh, uh, cortex is where uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, in integration of senses. And, um, and that's very important for architectural uh, reasons. Um, we're still working on some of more analysis on this. Uh, and then um, the idea here is that those were the effects of architecture uh, on people. And what we are trying to do now through the uh, BPS 19 with the eye tracking is to begin to look at what is it that causes those effects. I, I do understand that that's not a one-to-one -one correlation. It's a lot more complicated uh, than just this is the cause of that. Uh, but you know, you need to uh, make an argument to get a grant. <laughs> and you can say, well, there is indication that, you know. Okay, so you know we hear in Christianity you enter in, in a traditional church and you know of course it's organized and a church the church is the altar is there and do people really look at the altar? I mean, what is really happening? Uh, so the idea is to here to look at the, the 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 correlation between what people are looking, both consciously telling you and what unconsciously is happening. I think that's and this is a team. Uh, so it's a very large team. Uh, some of whom are here. Mohammed uh, hopefully will come tonight. Um, it's a it's a very large team and it takes a lot of uh, communication among all of us. But that's my part. Thank you. So I invite uh, the, the the panelists please to come and sit and don't play with my technology <laughs> or you pay for it. Although you have better toys than I do, John, Jonathan, way better toys. So the, the first thing I would say, uh, um, since I, I kind of moderate, uh, if you guys have any uh, questions for each other or comments before we open to the public. So I'll use my, uh, it's my, my sonic bias here. So a question for, for uh, you, Julio, is, um, how does sound figure into these two spaces? And um, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that it's not a factor. Um, so how did you factor that in? It, it was not a factor. <laughs> it's okay. not a factor. I mean, I mean, I think the, the question with this, and I think you only can do so much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just not factor in. And I could, I, I, I mean, it's unfortunately, but that's, a, that's the reality of it. Um, and that's one of the, 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 the issues. Uh, however, when we came to the uh, Basilica and there was some testing the, the organ and people got in um, and we make notes, so we'll see what happened to that. But, you know, we, you know, we only have 32 subjects, such, such a small number. Statistically, you can only do so much with 32. You know, maybe we get the $1 million and we can do 100. But uh, and this, this, the question here is, is another reality of this is funding, right? right? Which I think Anjan brought. I mean, you can only do so much. The technology is so much advanced. And if, you know, we talk about this, uh, you could get bogged down in, well, I'm not going to do this because it's basically, it's useless. But I think there is some pointing and some understanding that we could get of it. But the answer is, mm, sorry. Okay. I love music, but no. That, and so yeah. now I have a question. Yeah. I, don't, I don't understand saying that this thing you put on your head, the thing you put on your head didn't show up in the brain any place that was responding to the acoustics. Is that what you're saying? Or was it just not measured? It wasn't, it wasn't measured. But I mean, okay, so what that, that, tw that 20 sensors, and I think uh, has a very, 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 it's, it's very good, but it has many limitations. 
And the parietal lobe, I mean, the temporal lobes is the one that will capture the sound and any 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 possibility. The, the problem with the, with this, and the more you work, the more you realize the limitations. And of course, this is obsolete technology. You know, we what is two, two, two years old, which the new one is so much better. So you move, and there is some noise. So the temp, some of of these uh, sensors are located in places that are problematic in terms of noise. Uh, so there is. You can only claim so much in order for you to to survive peer review, <laughs> which is a whole other issue. So, so my other sound related question. So, um, one of the very sad facts of studying um, music in churches in Italy is that uh, in all of Rome, I found only one church which isn't entirely reliant on uh, microphones and loudspeakers that has completely um, permeated Catholicism. So, the, so there are, you know, there are no spaces that actually appreciate the original sound, acoustical sound of these spaces. That's that's a, a forgotten test. Now, in these ev evangelical churches, um, I've only been to one once um, as a visitor, um, and it seems to me that um, microphony and amplification is a fundamental feature of these. Yeah, the, the Evangelical Protestant Church has a great tradition in spectacle, in, in dramatics, uh, in using that to elicit emotion uh, as a community towards kind of the sacred myth that's there. So uh, to the credit of the black Walmart box, it's it's designed to do that. It cuts off all external sensory things so they can be completely controlled 100% to elicit kind of this emotional communal response to worship. That's that. Is it beautiful? No. So um, I was really uh, fascinated by uh, your work, actually. But uh, at some point, I was also wondering uh, whether it's so, so because we, we're talking about a priming effect, and some of the classical uh, priming experiments were more about uh, well, the exact location that you are performing the experiment, right? So there is this uh, old study where. Uh, well, if you hang a lot of old pictures, uh, pictures of old people on the wall, people feel like they are actually, you know, more tired and they feel, well, they're basically affected by, but this is like in the hallway uh, on their way to the experiment. It's nothing to do with the experiment itself. So I was wondering whether you, um, uh, well, I guess there's two questions in this one, uh, whether, whether your experiment was uh, always in the same uh, physical uh, settings uh, and whether you've considered to... Uh, to try to change the settings in which the, the experiments would uh, take place. Yeah, as I mentioned, this was a bit of a, a let's just poke at the question and let's just run a quick 200 person. I didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, I think there, this is the follow up to that. Uh, this is um, a lot of the research that I've done is focused on the unchurched, right? As evangelicals would define that. So in that case, it's never a sense of I'm driving, then I go to church. It's always I'm just driving to pick up my kid from school and I happen to see something on the side. Uh, that was the intent. So these, this was actually all just done digitally. Uh, so I could get a, a cross section of folks across the U.S., but there are further studies to this that would uh, kind of allow for our location to be more of a, a factor. Uh, I, I guess that Julio has a point when he talks about well the limitations of grants because that means that yeah you would have to rent a, a place that's near to a uh, <laughs> every time you have to change locations that's going to be be expensive. I have another question if it's uh, if it's all right. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering whether you think that um, so we measure an effect in the in the study. Uh, performed on the, with, with, the, with the, the whole project. But I was wondering whether you would expect to find the same kind of effect if the uh, users, the particip participants, were not uh, well strong believers. Or do you think if you contrasted the strong believers with, uh, well, non-believers, um, would you find the same kind of? I, I would I would expect that there will be a, 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 an effect of a contemplative effect on, in, in non-believers. Not the same, going back to some of the same effect, uh, in a, in a, just because it's just silence, aloneness, um, uh, there is there is you know cutting from the world. So there, I think there will be some effect. We get, we are applying for a grant to to test that hypothesis. Um, let me just say one more thing, and then we open to the people. But what I, I like about Zach's pro, um, approach, and I've been very impressed with Zach's work, is that he's able to and it's a little bit the same with. Uh, um, um, one of uh, what is that? What is that? Anyways, uh, with how you are able to simplify um, architectural events in ways that you could actually measure, 
you know, Elisabetta was going to say, you know, there's very simple, like, you know, the, an entry, you know, and you just go to the bones of that experience and able to the affordances and try to really uh, conduct an experiment that is empirical viable. And I think control of the, all the, the variables and um, produce results that are actually very, very uh, useful. So I, 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 I it's, it's a congratulation more than anything else. So. Okay, so any question from the audience? Yeah, there's a Yoshi. Please. Thank you. Uh, this is a clarifying question for Zach. So uh, you presented lots of uh, stuff in a short period of time. and. A really good job. So, you know, a great work. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you manipulated parameter of environment and then behavior of a human and bird and a honeybee change. So, and then you said that these, this behavior change was unconscious, right? But with, in the case of humans, you also have a, a, had an opportunity to ask them, what was your experience? So did you do that? Or if you did that, did they say, no, they, I, didn't, I didn't experience any change, no change, or did they say anything? That's what I wanna know. Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so first of all, um, I didn't give you an, like, an exhaustive review of all the studies that, because I sort of just wanted to allude you to say, well, the whole paper is there. If you want to read them, it's, it's there. But, um, well, you're right, because with human beings, you can ask them, uh, did you notice any change? And in those experiments, they did not experience any differences in their uh, environment. And this is why I found it, you know, uh, valuable. So uh, almost none of them would say, yeah, uh, there's a difference. Um, so no, there, there was no awareness of uh, environmental changes. We, you could also ask the honeybee, but the... The problem is not if you can ask it, it's the answer it gives you. Uh, it's not so useful. But uh, yeah, so there was no awareness. Correct. You measure the behavior, so they either the speed of their behavior, but faster or slower, that kind of thing. Yes, correct. These completely behavioral measures. There were no electrophysiological measures of any kind. Yeah. So unfortunately, but we're working on that as I as I saw, as I saw, showed you before. Hmm. So so what is the you had, to, you had to use you're not you're not allowed to speak without this <laughs> I mean, just 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 you're in, you're in troublemaker you speak so loudly and so so anyway one of the things we know from psychology is that you know if you ask people like you know why did you make this choice then what people tell you is usually gibberish but you can still ask them, like, what was your experience? You know, mm -hmm. are you feeling this way or that way? Or you can let them. So I think maybe in the future, you know, I encourage you to try to get to that, that uh, first person data from subject who is going through your study and you are manipulating their behavior, quote unquote, unconsciously. But you're also looking at the kind of manifestation of conscious, conscious experience you know, and then see whether there's no change or some change, but then that's where you might need a, some a little more sophisticated mm. uh, phenomenological probing, like maybe using something like this micro phenomenology that Sarah talked about. Yeah. It's an interviewing <clears throat> technique, but it sort of probes subject into reflecting on their experience a little more um, carefully. So. so, so can you use the microphone, please? Well, you want to know whether there has been a, you want to know whether there has been a change or some alteration in uh, the level of consciousness. So, I think in my mind, you want to know whether, as that was saying, uh, subject couldn't tell whether there has been any change, but they, they their behavior was different. Their behavior was uh, changed. And then they weren't aware of it. But then what does other aspects? They, did they notice something else? You know, so, but without asking question, we don't know. We'll never know. So, yeah. 
um I, th I think i'll try to answer this uh, very briefly but i think it's more uh, the question is so good it deserves a discussion afterwards i think i will not be able to to answer completely now but i will give you three answers i think the first one being that uh, is very radical i think but i personally don't really believe in introspection um so for me microphonology or not uh, i don't think that you will come close to the subjective the pure subjective experience in any way the next question is uh, well the next answer would be for me um, so um, in, in, uh, in cognitive neuroscience, we have this implicit belief that uh, what makes us different is our conscious experience, but what makes us all similar is the unconscious processes. Um, and this is why usually you would have like a huge population, like a huge number of and like participants. So you can uh, basically uh, average away all the, um, well, subjective uh, nuances that, in, that are present in your response. Uh, be they physiological or behavioral. Um, there's just a problem with that, that you're trying to, in that case, we're trying to generalize the experience. And so the subjective experience sort of disappears ipso facto. Uh, it cannot exist simultaneously. It's like you cannot be concrete and uh, uh, general at the same time. So there's like this trade-off that I think, um, this is a difficult question for me as well when I do these experiments. And I think your question is right on, uh, 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 um, Right, right on point uh, in terms of that. Um, the, the, the final uh, answer would be that I think that you are uh, absolutely right to suggest that, that this is maybe something we should look into because I am not, although I do not believe in introspection at all, I will, I will perform the, uh, the experiment and I will use the data because I still, I still, I don't think that I'm right. Uh, it's just an opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> Hello. Uh, this is for Zach also. Uh, so do you believe we are incapable or completely incapable of actually accessing our unconscious? Or do you think this is actually within capacity? And if so, do you think, for example, an a neurodivergent individual could actually have a higher uh, possibility of achieving this? Uh, fantastic question. I should just uh, be sure to announce that uh, I don't know anything. Uh, and if I will give you an answer now, it's uh, pure speculation, because I, I think that those kinds of questions need uh, empirical evidence to support. Um, so pure speculation, I'll answer. Um, I, I think that, uh, well, people are different and people, some are very good at introspective uh, skills. They have introspective skills, some just don't. And I think that this could be cultural, could be so many, I mean, there could be so many reasons for this. I'm not quite sure why, but I think that, um, well, and speaking of neurodiversity, that probably, yes, some will be better at it, some would be worse. And I imagine there will be some kind of bell curve representing that. Um, I don't know about the confidence level of the uh, the bell curve, but I imagine there will be something like that. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Jonathan, I have a question for you. Um, it was pretty intriguing when you pointed at uh, go to the KV Utah and then the work you're doing in Peru and other places with non um, no Western architecture and uh, and acknowledging our Western bias, European. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if you had uh, any in progress insights on already certain biases that we, we bring into the question that perhaps already, or, or hypothesis of different attitudes towards sonic environments and, and uh, architecture. Um, so it's a great question. I have intuitions. I have no real insights yet. Um, so I have a student from Iran who's looking at uh, Islamic places in, in Isfahan. And, you know, in Islam is, is problematic because there is no music tradition in the mosque, but there is chanting. And, um, and so we're trying to understand, um, and, and there are these phenomenal domes and geometric structures that, um, that reflect the sound in phenomenally interesting ways. So we're working on the intuition that that's that's a role, and and you know that brings us to a point where um, we're a culture that says that claims that's not music, you know. So we're we're sort of facing this funny moment. Um, 
in terms of in terms of archaeological sites like these caves in Utah, there are pictograms of flute players sitting outside of these of these caves, and some archaeologists feel that they're pointing towards sonically important spaces. Mm -hmm. So we have rich body of 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 uh, intuitions to follow, but no real knowledge yet. Thank you. Oh, maybe one more question for Matthew now. This question. So, um, do you, and I know the answer, a little bit answer because we discussed it, but I, maybe I want you to share maybe with people uh, about your search for some sort of, for the, the evangelical Protestant, perhaps acknowledging that architecture may be significant. And uh, you know, whether it's a secret agenda in your study can you, and how, how you can use science and empirical to really perhaps advance that cause that part of evangelization, perhaps architecture has a role like Catholics, you know, the, you know, the, the reform, the counter reform and so on. So can you say something about that? Your... Yeah, it's for this type of work, empirical theological aesthetics, perhaps unexpectedly, your home audience is evangelical Protestants. Uh, much of the um, heart language, if you will, uh, studying sacred spaces goes back to sociological and empirical work. Uh, for, for the evangelicals, as long as it's related to missions. So uh, when I began looking at sacred spaces, the inclination was to do theology. I've got all my seminary work done and, and work on the liturgy and theological aesthetics and theology, but I knew that wouldn't get an audience at all. So this is where I originally made the turn to empirical aesthetics to look at the heart language of evangelicals to say, hey, this is what matters to them. And can we show that, that spaces are of importance or perhaps in a different way than they think? Um, and a lot of the studies and work I'm looking at begin to show uh, in a really fascinating moment where evangelicals begin to rediscover transcendence in a broader sense and understand that. And then the empirical work is coming to buttress the notion that for unchurched beauty is, is it. it. It's the driver of preference, it's the driver of attendance, it's the driver of everything, where it was originally kind of eschewed from, from that tradition. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting moment, both in the tactic and technique of using empirical studies uh, but also in kind of the a semblance of theology that's beginning to perhaps discover something that you Catholics have known forever. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I don't know if you would know, but okay. But Matthew, I'm, I'm trying to, as you say that, I'm trying to understand, and maybe you can reflect on the movement of certain Protestant groups into Orthodoxy right. for this very reason. You want to say anything about that? Is that part of what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, certainly I can I can uh, perhaps reflect on at a personal level the number of friends I've had who have moved into more liturgical traditions, who have longed for that depth, who have desired uh, usually that thickness of uh, phenomenological experience as opposed to the thinness. Uh, and so part of the the new movement into this is coming from younger, uh, perhaps scholars like myself and and younger theologians who are who are driving this. Thank you, thank you, the panelists.